Thank this you. conference will now be recorded. You are being recorded. You want to start again so you're on the record? No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, everybody, uh, welcome. Um, this is, I think, I believe is our second meeting online. And uh, I'd like to thank Danielle. Danielle has been fundamental at allowing us to do this meetings. Thank you, Danielle. You, you, you rock. Uh, I know uh, many of you, we have been talking through this lack and uh, I just want to do a little FYSA. It's uh, where we are now as a group uh, as of today, the 28th. So the meetings obviously will continue online. We don't know when this will solve or would relent. Uh, when that happens, we will obviously will make an assessment. Everybody knows the conference has been canceled. Uh, we decided to cancel it. And then, then like two days later, uh, the library pretty much told us, yeah, we're canceling everything. So, so it was not going to happen, unfortunately. So we'll, we'll talk about, we'll pick up on that once we, we pass this. Um, you can volunteer your your presentations. Uh, you can email us at info at hackmiami.org. Uh, I'm getting a lot of uh, uh, good people sending me offers for. Uh, present absolutely. We'll put you up, um, and uh, we're, I'm working on some content in the in the in the following meetings. Uh, if we can get two or three presentations, by all means, we 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 can do it. It's up to you. As of now, we're gonna we, we're gonna keep the schedule unless I start getting uh, enough to say okay, we have enough, so we can spread it out and and have the most content that we can. not uh, for those who are uh, watching this and are not at this lack, uh, you're missing out. Uh, you can email us at info at hackmiami.org and we, we will send you an invite to the Slack channel. In the Slack channel, we have several things that are, that are very important. One of them is the, the current disaster channel, where we're talking about the current chatter intelligence that's happening um, in regards to the, the COVID-19 uh, and the industry. Uh, we get a lot of job postings. If you are affected by the current uh, uh, crisis, where I know it's too early yet, but I, 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 I've been hearing that there's been layoffs already, uh, and some people have been let go. Please uh, um, join the job offers channel, uh, join the Slack, and we can certainly uh, uh, try to help you uh, try to find a job and, and, and place you as soon as possible. Um, so that's important. Uh, hit us up at, 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 at the email address and, and, and we'll do our best. Uh, most of you, you know, I believe most of you are above anybody in intelligence. So this goes to say, uh, you know, don't stay home. Uh, we, we've been getting reports that the people are still out and the more, the longer the people stay out, the worse this will get. So, so please stay home and check out the, uh, the meetups. We have people from the West Coast and we have people from the East Coast. So Hack Miami obviously is championing the East Coast. Uh, we might start mixing them up at one point. Uh, I just want to make sure we spread out the the content so so we keep in touch with each other every every two weeks or so. Uh, we do have a number of meetings that are coming up in Hack Miami and then uh, a number of meetings that are coming up with Pacific Hackers. You can follow the main Twitter account, which is Hack Miami. Um, and uh, um, I truly thank you very much for attending this and, and keeping all going. Uh, we depend on everybody for this, including our group. If you have content and you want to present, by all means, uh, those who have had experience with this type of events, I welcome any type of input or or experience. Like we done it in the last conference, for example, we had a how to survive a hurricane, and there were some some great tips about how, you know how to deal with lack of power and and many other things that are related to that uh, type of situation. Uh, I'm sure we can probably find somebody that can give us some tips of how to uh, cope with this type of crisis, although it looks like it's pretty much new for everybody. Uh, with this in mind today, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about uh, drone security. I'd like to thank Henry. Uh, so Rod, I think you're cutting out. Um, I think you are um, inviting Henry, yes? Oh, should I? No, uh, I have 
You're, you were cutting out, so I just want to make sure you oh, were Oh, I'm ready. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give it to you so you can uh, introduce him. Wonderful. All right, Henry, you're ready to rock and roll. I'm going to make your PC the presenter. Is that okay? Okay, perfect. All right, you are going to get a make presenter. Poof, you are the presenter. You're on a Mac or a PC? PC. I switched, so... Uh... There you go. You are all set, sweetie. Thank you. Let me know if you need anything. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, some introductory to drone security. We're going to cover three main areas, which are defending from drones. That is why there was a rise in, in needing to defend from drones. Um, some cool projects in which people use drones to hack other drones. And then a couple of tips on what you can do to harden uh, your devices. So let's start with uh, the need from protecting from drones. Basically, it comes from there's already a bunch of crazy ideas. Some of them might look fun, like uh, shooting fireworks on an airsoft gun from it. But you can see how this could be easily uh, weaponized in a worse way and why authorities are worried about uh, ba what basically a lot of people consider just toys. So. Uh, there have been other situations in which people, in this case, protesters, had a police drone flying above them, and they had this really powerful uh, green lasers, just all of them pointing them uh, at the bottom part of it. They made it either force it to land or crash. People are not actually sure. At the end, I'm going to leave a bunch of references. You can read the article over there and the different theories of uh, why the drone came down. Um, the most common thing you're going to see out there are drone guns. Um, they're pretty expensive, and I'm going to show you basically the different components that they have. And in reality, they, they could be a lot cheaper, but they sell, for example, for 10 grand or even more. But they basically cover the most common frequencies, 2.4 uh, gigahertz uh, for the remote control, 5.8 for the video, and um, GPS, GLONASS, and other uh, global positioning systems. Um, the other type of gun is not that common. It basically just shoots an app. But this is the most common type, and it basically has the following components. Uh, something to work uh, the GPS. You can get um, an SDR, either a cheap one, like the new ELEC, which actually reaches a little bit above uh, what you need for the GPS, so that should work. If not, the hacker ref should be all that you need. Um, the, these devices would allow you to not also jam the signal, but also spoof the signal. But in many cases, if you uh, manage to interrupt the GPS communication on a drone, you will force it to land on the location where it is. So maybe just a uh, GPS jammer, which a lot of uh, for legal reasons, a lot of people are selling them as GPS signal generators, and those are uh, super cheap. So next for uh, a lot of drones use just regular Wi-Fi to communicate. So uh, many of you may, might already know that there's a bunch of different options for that, depending on the type of antenna. Um, it's recommended to choose this. If you saw in the, in the drone gun, it was basically a Yagi antenna, like the bottom uh, left one that you see there. That is basically uh, what it uses, a directional antenna to jam the signal. Uh, you can get a cheaper one, like the alpha panel antenna. Or you can, there's people that have even done a can antenna, basically using a can to create a, a directional antenna. In one of the references, you're going to see a project that basically uses exactly that to take down the drone. And for the transmitter, of course, you just get a Wi-Fi card, or again, you can actually also use the uh, high RF. And finally, for video, again, the high RF, or I'll, uh, basically, you can just get a powerful uh, FPV video transmitter and make it uh, hop through the different channels. And there's also super expensive um, 5.8 gigahertz jammers that you can get. And all of these devices basically are the different components that you would see in an actual drone gun. 
that jammer on the bottom right has actually been used uh, in prisons because people have used drones to try to carry uh, smuggle stuff into the prisons and have been using drones in order to do that. Now, let's talk about hacking a drone with uh, another drone. Basically, from the different products that I showed you, the, the components that would make a drone gun are pretty much the same components that you can put on top of a drone and just hack away other drones with just that. Uh, it would be pretty, well, not pretty cheap, but it would rather it would be rather accessible. A lot of these things are open source and you're gonna see later on, we're gonna talk a little bit about commercial drones versus uh, DEI drones. And of course, a DEI drone, the one that you make yourself with open source parts is gonna be um, super easy to customize. You'll be able to add a bunch of different sensors and components. But of course, uh, the cons to that it will be that it's super time consuming. And a lot of the mods require some advanced knowledge. And because of there's many different options uh, in both open source software and hardware, you might find a tutorial or some someone did a little bit of research on something, but it doesn't quite apply to the particular device that you have. So going the DEI way, um, it's gonna be, um, it's gonna give you a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, you're gonna be fixing and, and doing a bunch of fidgeting around trying to figure out how to uh, get it to the next step. On the other hand, you can get a commercial drone. Uh, a lot of them are, uh, people have invested a lot of time with them. Um, there's a particular uh, drone, the Parrot AR Drone 2.0. That one, a lot of people have done mods on it. So uh, for a commercial drone, it's super easy to mod. And there's plenty of uh, resources online because a lot of people have, have, uh, have been working on this particular model. Uh, the cons would be that they have limited amount of sensors. Basically, this model in particular doesn't come with a GPS. You can buy that one. Uh, but that's basically it. And if you want to start adding like more hacking elements, like a Raspberry Pi or something, it has a limited payload carry weight versus doing your own drone, you'll basically be able to make it carry whatever. Uh, this one will only be able to carry like a small Raspberry Pi and a battery and that's it. So there's also a bunch of tools and projects um, for both attacking and defending your drones. Now we're gonna talk about attacking out of the drones and you're gonna see that for Parrot and DJI, which are two of the major uh, commercial drone makers. There's a lot of tools to attack those two uh, vendors. So Skyjack is a very common project. Uh, when you basically you Google uh, drone hacking and this is one of the first things uh, that is gonna come out. It uses the drone that I just showed you to hack other drones just like it and try to remote control them. And there's a bunch of other projects similar to that one that try to do the same thing. So you're gonna find a bunch of information out there. For DJI, there's also a bunch of information out there. There's a lot of people doing reverse engineering. Uh, so you'll be able to get into a lot of the commercial drones in a way that uh, wouldn't be normally possible uh, compared to a DEI drone in which everything is open source. We're gonna see a little bit more about that uh, next. But there's also generic attacks. So um, Icarus, for example, attacks the DSMX protocol, which is the common uh, protocol that you are, are gonna find in remote, uh, remote controllers, transmitters, everything that you use to actually control the drone other than Wi-Fi, they use the they use very similar frequencies, not exactly the same, but they have a different protocols, they would use different modulation. But in particular, because the DSMX protocol is uh, the most common one, you'll be able to find what you normally call like a breakout board that you can hook up to your Raspberry Pi and just do the same thing. Attach it to the drone, be able to uh, hack other drones that use this very common protocol. And of course, um, we were talking about GPS jamming, but also we mentioned GPS poofing, which is uh, something that has been used in order to 
try to make uh, the drone travel in a different direction, try to make it force uh, where it is, stuff like that. Now, for hardening drones, and this is where uh, we split a little bit because it will be very different for commercial and open source drones. Uh, of course, the DEI uh, open source uh, path will be easier to modify. You can just get an actual radio controller uh, that you can flash the firmware with open source software. Uh, same for the uh, flight controller, the receiver, everything else. So all of that you'll be able to manipulate freely versus the commercial drones, which uh, like we already mentioned, uh, there's limited options on what you can do for some models. A lot of people have been working on them and they have shared what they have been working on. For other, other models, you won't be able to find much information. But in general, and in both cases, you're gonna have limited options that don't include hardware mods. So that is modifying some, what, something in the drone itself. It, it, for many cases, it won't be just plug and play. Now for commercial drones, uh, like I said, there's not much that you can do. Basically just keeping the firmware updated. As you saw for DJI and Parrot, there's a lot of hacks going out. So the vendors are actually uh, trying to get on top of things, updating their firmware, protecting from these vulnerabilities and making the files available for uh, the customers to download and uh, reflash the firmware. They don't, they don't seem to have any type of uh, auto update feature, which would be nice. Um, but in many cases, you'll just be able to uh, put the image on the, on the SD card and just turn on the drone and it will update on itself. Now, as we saw, a lot of them come with Wi-Fi, either to just share video, to uh, change configurations, to actually fly it entirely, stuff like that. And in a lot of cases, they don't come with uh, Wi-Fi encryption enabled. So if there's an option, if it comes with an app that lets you modify that, you should try to add a, a password, uh, make it encrypted, make it secure. And you can also, in some models, disable pairing with more than one device at a time would be a great idea. So somebody else won't be able to try to wiggle you away. They, was, they just won't be able to connect if you change that setting. In I believe it was a... Yeah, available in DJI that you can put the amount of people that can, can connect to the drone. And yeah, you can modify it in a way that only you will be able to connect. Now for the commercial drones, like we said, if you connect over Wi-Fi, there's gonna be a couple of services enabled. You're gonna have FTP um, to share uh, the videos, whatever was recorded by the drone, you can download, download it over Wi-Fi through FTP and you're gonna have Telnet. Now, if Telnet is enabled, in a lot of cases, you'll be able to connect without credentials. In some cases, you're gonna get a limited account. In other cases, you're gonna get root, and you'll be able to modify uh, the subsystem that it has. It actually is just Busybox. Um, so you'll be able to just modify whatever you need uh, in order to make it safer. Just make sure that you have a backup of the drone's firmware, just in case you make any mistakes, you'll be able to recover it. Now, because of this attack, this type of attacks, people had already identified that Telnet was vulnerable. So some vendors decided to add a password in order to try to protect what you were uh, able to do if you were in that Wi-Fi, in the drone's Wi-Fi. But a lot of them have a, a smartphone app that you can download, you open it up, and you can change the settings. And it never really asks you for any type of uh, credentials. So the thing is that for a lot of vendors, they use the same credentials for all drones. Even DJI did it, and a lot of the smaller vendors also do it. So what you can do is just connect to the Wi-Fi, open up the smartphone app, and sniff the communication when you connect to the drone using Wireshark and you're gonna see the credentials just flying through and you can use that same credentials to log into Telnet in the drone and do uh, what I just suggested. You can modify stuff, be able to 
hardened to return just like basically any other Linux system. Um, again, just make sure that you have a backup for it. Now for DEI drones, there's of course a lot more options. Uh, you'll be able to just add whatever you need to add and modify the source code in whichever way you need to uh, modify it. Now, of course, there's a couple of things that you have to do that are just like for uh, commercial drones. That is uh, disable pairing with more than one device at a time and keep firmware and related software updated. Basically those two, just like for commercial drones, you need to keep everything updated, but of course you have the option to modify the source code, uh, the source code as needed. That means that you'll be able to play around, change settings, test how it goes. If it doesn't work, you just download the coding software again. There's a lot more that you can do and you can add more flight sensors. So as we saw, there's a bunch of different type of attacks that basically are limited. The most common uh, attacks are limited to just uh, GPS, which is used for uh, al the altitude and fixed position. Now for both altitude and fixed position, there are other uh, sensors that you can add that will uh, complement what the GPS is seeing. So if the GPS goes out, you still have other sensors that can be used in order to determine, okay, this is my position, this is uh, my altitude. So it doesn't really rely just on GPS in order to do that. For the alt meters, uh, we saw that laser, uh, maybe it's not such a good idea. Basically you put a small uh, laser range finder on the bottom of the drone and it uses that to determine the altitude. But people have the theory that um, the drone that we saw the, the protesters take down was because it probably had a, a laser sensor on the bottom. But ultrasonic mixed with barometric uh, sensors would actually be a great idea for a drone because the ultrasonic has a shorter range and the barometric doesn't really work great on shorter range, but it works great on larger ranges. So using those two, it would be a great way to uh, complement the GPS in order to try to determine part of the position that it needs. And for the fixed position, a very common uh, solution is called optical flow tracking, which is basically just putting a camera, taking a, a picture of what the camera sees and then taking a picture just uh, in a very short time, uh, time frame and comparing the images and seeing if the drone is drifting in any particular direction and try to correct it. In theory, there are attacks against uh, this type of uh, uh, this type of uh, sensors. In in one case in particular, for example, the Pirate uh, AR drone that we, uh, that we talked about earlier, that one uses that to try to get the fixed position if you don't have a GPS module. And some people found out that if you point at a really bright laser. Uh, on the floor, apparently the drone uses that laser to try to uh, fix it as that's the fixed position. So it's gonna use that dot, you leave it like really, um, you try not to move the, the, the laser dot right below the drone. The drone uses that dot to determine, okay, I, this is what I'm gonna use so I, I don't drift away. And then you start slowly moving the laser and the drone will follow it. Um, of course, if you have an open source solution, modifying the code so it doesn't rely on just one point would be a, a good approach. And there's actually uh, some research done on it that you're gonna see also in the references. Now, for backup and recovery channels, that is, other types of communication are actually used to control the drone. What would happen if uh, you lose connection on one of those? Well, one of the elements that we, um, that I commonly saw when I was doing the research was people just using uh, a cell phone in order to communicate with it. Actually, you can just buy a GSM or, or 3G uh, breakout board. You put a SIM card, you connect it to a Raspberry Pi, to an Arduino or whatever. And a lot of people were using it as a recovery method. That is, you lost your drone, 
uh, you can basically just send a text and it will reply back with a GPS location. Or actually using it to control it, because it's not as fast as using an actual transmitter, a uh, remote controller. But because the drone, if, if it already has a bunch of sensors like GPS and it has barometric uh, pressure sensor and optical fault tracking, it probably doesn't need to rely on immediate controls right away. So that was probably a, a partial option, but a most common option, or actually a, not more common, but definitely uh, sounds like a ver better idea, would be to use just another uh, method of communication. LoRa, which stands for low, uh, long range, is actually a very tiny device like the one you see uh, on the right. It's the one with the uh, antenna. And it uses very little energy, which is perfect for uh, a drone. It has long range. I mean, it was designed with that objective, and that's how it got the name. And you can see that the model is actually super tiny. So using that as a main communication channel would be a viable option. It doesn't have... Um, transfer rates that would allow you to send video or stuff like that, but at least for the remote control, it would be definitely enough. It's a way lower frequency than the common 2.7 gigahertz. That actually means that it's going to have better, uh, it's going to, as it is a longer uh, wavelength, it will be easier for it to go through walls and stuff like that, unlike Wi-Fi. So it should theoretically have a lot better reception in, in, in areas which, in which you have a lot of constructions and stuff like that, a lot of buildings. So that would be a better alternative. And none of the drone guns that you're going to see on the market aim for this kind of frequency or devices. So that would be just one of the many options that you have to use either backup recovery channels or actually a device like that as, a, as your main communication channel. Now for video, as you may know, basically uh, a drone will have a, a video transmitter. You'll be able to choose a channel and then the receiver, you do the same. You select the channel and it's gonna see the image, but it doesn't have any type of encryption, any type of security. Basically, even people, um, so drones normally use the same frequencies as baby monitors. So anybody that has a baby monitor receiver will be able to see what your drone sees if you're not using some type of uh, encoder. Um, I saw a vendor that sells the ones on the bottom center. Um, they call it scramblers, but don't actually work as, as scramblers. Apparently, they're just encoders. Um, but adding that, so on one end, you add it in between the camera and the transmitter. And the other one, you put it in between the receiver and uh, the screen in which you see the uh, video feed. And that will mean that anybody who tries to read the communication on the air will see just garbage on the screen instead of uh, what the drone is actually seeing. And a little summary on the references. Um, I put uh, the three top videos at the top so you have an idea of what people have been doing with drones and one why there's a lot of other people worried about uh, drones and invested in, in drone security. Uh, the Fireworks drone, there's the Instagram link for... Uh, Henry? Yep. Yeah. Uh, you cut out just a little bit there. Can you start, start over on this slide, please? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Um, so a bit of a summary on uh, the references. I put the three first links are basically uh, the several different reasons uh, why people have been getting worried about drones, the stuff that has been going out. We didn't talk about other uh, more worrisome stuff. Um, I don't know if, he, if anybody uh, knows that drones have already been, commercial drones just like the DJI, have been used uh, to drop bombs and stuff like that. So there's a lot of reasons why people are getting worried. There's a lot of people that claim that these videos like the fireworks drone or the airsoft drone are really cool ideas. And I actually, in a way, I agree. I think they're cool ideas, but they're 
easy uh, to take in the wrong direction. And then there's a lot of links on the bottom that I just put them all together. There's basically a lot of different uh, projects, uh, articles, a lot of uh, extra information, some of it that you saw on the presentation regarding uh, drone hacking, um, defending from other drones, how to do certain attacks like the uh, GPS spoofing attacks and other similar elements uh, that you'll be able to see, either projects that you can use, uh, do yourself or ideas that you can follow. There's an article about um, people that modify their drones um, and which are better to be modified. So I hope that you get some extra information from those links. And that will be it. If you have any questions, that will be the perfect moment. Harry, I have a question. If you wanted to get started on flying drones uh, outdoor, which one would you buy? Uh, for outdoors, I would buy basically any GPS assisted drone. Um, those will be the easiest if, if, again, if you're flying outdoors. If you're flying indoors, there's a lot of them that have like special protection uh, around the uh, props or sensors to avoid collision. Um, but if you're flying outside and you have the ability to use GPS, that's probably going to be the easiest and the cheapest option. Um, in many cases, you can get a drone super cheap. Like I just got one for $140 and it has a bunch of GPS functions. Uh, it has assisted uh, takeoff and landing. Uh, it can follow you around. You can set waypoints on, on a map and it will follow those, stuff like that. So for outdoor flying, you can get a super cheap drone that has um, basically GPS assisted flying or just any of the um, fancy GPS op options that I just uh, mentioned. And if you want to take it a, a step further, you can check that they have uh, additional sensors. Um, so you'll be able to make sure, like I just said, a lot of them are going to have a camera or a laser underneath that is used uh, for assisted takeoff and landing or to try to avoid drifting when, when you're flying with uh, strong airs, uh, strong winds. So any of those options, you can get it for 200, 300. If you look for, you, you can just go to Amazon, look around the $200 uh, range, and all of them are gonna have the uh, options I just mentioned. Of course, you can always uh, invest a little bit more and go with one of the major vendors, but they're basically gonna have uh, pretty much the same functions maybe a couple more. DJI implemented something that is really cool, which is called geofencing. And what it does is the drone already knows where it's not supposed to fly, like into an airport or something. So you won't be able to accidentally drift off into that location. So that basically takes a huge headache uh, away. You don't have to worry so much about what if I'm flying in, in, in an area if I shouldn't. Well, as long as it's not private property, the drone through geofencing uh, will not go into anything that is, well, more dangerous or the private property. So basically you only need to not fly above uh, other people and then the drone will take care about not accidentally getting into an airport or whatever. Um, but anything within that range will work wonders for what uh, you wanna do just flying outdoors. Uh, Henry, uh, a question for you. Uh, hello. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 what are the major protocols uh, used in the drone? Uh, you have mentioned like a GPS, a lot of kind of thing. Uh, are there any other uh, uh, customized protocols uh, which is supporting for the uh, based on the channels level and uh, also the what kind of a frequency majority of the drones are using? Yeah, yeah, let me go, yeah. Let me go back a bit. So if you see 
one of the last, uh, third to the last one. So he said, at, and Icarus is the one that attacks the DSMX protocol, which is the most common protocol that works on 2.4 gigahertz. So oh, the two options that you have, if you want to attack this type of protocols, you won't be able to use a Wi-Fi card, a regular Wi-Fi card, because basically the whole protocol, the whole modulation is different, but you can use either the hacker ref, uh, SDR, which will allow you to tune into this frequency and then basically demodulate everything that the uh, DSMX protocol is sending. Or since that particular protocol is the most common one, you'll be able to find hardware that you can hook up to an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi or any other microcomputer and you can program it to do whatever it, it is that you want. It could be um, Normally, they use uh, key pairs so that you won't be able to inject your own code. But those key pairs are base, are super easy to brute force. So if you uh, see in the references about Icarus, there's a paper that uh, it's not actually a paper, it's just an article. It talks a little bit about how they, they came about uh, hacking that particular protocol. But other transmitters might use any of the other protocols that you see down there, like DSM2. Uh, M-Link, uh, FHSS, and any of the other ones. So you're going to have uh, different options. But at least the SMX uh, is the most common one. So it should be the easiest one to target. Okay, okay. thank you, Henry. I have another question, Henry. There is a lot of, uh, uh, if you go Googling, um, for people that wants to get started on this, there's a bunch of courses. Uh, in the range of a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, and then they claim that they certify you as a pilot and and a bunch of other stuff. Is that worth it or not? What's your What's your opinion on that? Um, so, particular for the U.S., there's a couple of things that will become uh, important or an issue. Right now, you don't actually need a, a pilot license to fly, but uh, the FCC and the uh, FAA, so basically everything regarding uh, wireless transmissions and everything regarding um, flying objects um, is getting heavily regulated. So at the very least, right now you do need a pilot license for certain cases. For example, uh, if you're gonna fly above people, like in a big event, and you wanna record that event, you do need a pilot uh, license for that. Uh, but definitely seems like they're trying to regulate this a lot more. It could happen that eventually everybody will need uh, a pilot license for basically any type of flying. But so for right now, you don't actually need it. Um, I have heard very good reviews on a couple of uh, basically these pilot classes. So I think they might be worth it, but I haven't tried it myself and I haven't done the research uh, enough to actually recommend uh, anything in particular. But I, I definitely can say that I've heard a lot of good things about them. But it's, as of right now, it's not strictly necessary. But it's worth paying for it? It seems that it is. I've heard from a lot of people that uh, it seems that it is. So if you want, I can ask them in particular which one they recommend. And I can uh, share the links uh, through Slack. Thank you. Of course. Uh, any other? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one last question. Actually, are you? Uh, will you share uh, these uh, PPTs uh, to our respect to emails or how it is? Uh, yeah, uh, I can share it what, uh, whichever way you guys prefer. Normally what I do is just find whatever free uh, file sharing service there is. I upload it and then put the link on Slack. Okay, sure, sure. sure. Perfect. Uh, any other questions? Um, I do see one in um, 
the Slack channel. Somebody asked, uh, I think Mac asked, uh, which drone did you buy for 140 bucks that has GPS? Oh, uh, let me see if I can find the link. But it's called, uh, the brand, the maker, is called SnapTime. SnapTime? Okay. SnapTime. Like Captain, but with Snap on the front. Uh-huh. And, damn it, I can't remember the model. It's all right. When you track it down, uh, we can throw it into um, Slack if you want to answer Max's question. Perfect. Click Slack. All right, any other questions for Henry? Rod, did you want to uh, circle back? Natalie posted a, a link in chat. So. No, well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be posting the video of this and the uh, slides soon. And uh, thanks again, Danielle. Again, those who, um, those who came out late, if you send us an email to hackmiami.org, info at hackmiami.org, I'll be able to join you into the Slack channel, and then we can continue the conversation until we meet again. All right, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a fabulous weekend. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Thank you. Bye, guys.